Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar, Empowering Active Aging. I'm Ariella Roth, Director of Client and Community Relations at Montefiore. Before we commence, I'd like to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of elders past and present on which this meeting takes place. Montefiore's Spotlight series discusses different perspectives on aging and addresses issues that affect older community members and their loved ones. Each session explores an aspect of aging, including health and wellness, research and innovation, making the right choices in aged care and supporting older family and community members. This evening, we welcome three Montefiore staff members as our expert panelists. Welcome to Michelle Kleiner, Acting General Manager of Allied Health Residential Services, Alexandra Carey, Acting Manager of Dietetics and Speech Pathology, and Maxine Rabus, Manager Client Engagement Therapies. Michelle brings 20 years of experience as a clinical dietitian and clinical educator to her role at Montefiore. She has consulted on several nutrition guidelines and national standards of care and has presented at conferences nationally and internationally. Michelle is particularly proud of a volunteer feeding program she developed and led for over 10 years. This program was published in neuroscience journals and won a New South Wales Health Award. Alex graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Speech Therapy and continued to focus her interest on the care of swallowing disorders, completing a master's degree in dysphagia in 2015. Alex has 10 years of experience working in a variety of different settings, including age care, disability, brain injury, oncology, and pediatrics. Maxine completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology and a postgraduate in education cum laude. With a strong interest in engagement and experiential learning, Maxine then pursued further studies in expressive therapy and is currently enrolled in a Master's of Therapeutic Arts. Maxine joined Montefiore in 2008 and believes that working with older people is a privilege. Maxine is passionate about engagement, leisure and creative therapy opportunities, which provide purpose, well-being and resident connection. The provision of allied health services in residential care was a significant outcome of the recent Royal Commission into Aged Care. Montefiore has always recommended the importance and contribution allied health practitioners have made to the clinical and health outcomes for our residents. With 120 allied health professionals on staff, our residents receive holistic care tailored to their individual needs. A quick reminder, you're welcome to type questions in the chat box, which we will answer during the Q&A time at the end of the presentation. Now let's get our discussion started for the evening. Michelle, let's start with you. Can... Hi, Hi, Michelle. Ella. Thanks for having me. What a pleasure. Can you please give an overview of Allied Health and its role when considering holistic care? Sure. I'll just, um, if you can just bear with me, I'll just share my slides. Okay. All right. Okay, so in terms of Allied Health, this really is a term used to describe a broad range of trained health professionals that work alongside doctors and nurses, many having completed a four to five year postgraduate university degree. We are the second largest clinical workforce after nursing and midwifery in Australia, and Allied Health are an essential part of the healthcare team that enables older people to function well physically, socially, and emotionally by optimising independence and supporting older adults to live their best life. Allied Health professionals use their specialised skill set and knowledge to complete healthcare assessments and provide individually tailored recommendations. This slide demonstrates a variety of specialists that come under the Allied Health umbrella, all of which we have here at Monty. To briefly explain a few, I've got creative therapists that utilize dance, music, and art to improve physical and mental and emotional wellness. I've got occupational therapists who support individuals with independence and safety in their daily routines, such as showering, um, transportation, even feeding. Um, and in aged care facilities, they also complete cognitive assessment and equipment prescriptions to prevent falls and pressure injuries. Social workers are involved in the delivery of aged care and care support services. Within, and within aged care facilities, social workers help to optimise the social well-being initially in the adjustment to life in a new residence and ongoing as needed. 
Social workers also provide supportive personal counselling to you and your loved ones if required. Many of the allied health services are covered within the homes care packages and are available through Monty's Help at Home program. Otherwise, they can be available through a GP care plan. Embedded within the allied health is the values of holistic care. Holistic care considers the physical, intellectual, socio-cultural and spiritual aspects of a person's life in their care planning to optimise their physical wellbeing. Through a holistic care framework, the consumer is viewed as their own person and recommended treatment strategies are tailored to their beliefs and values, not just their ailments. We recognise that a person's needs are all interconnected and therefore an improvement in one area, be it in mind, body or spirit, will have a positive flow and effect. Holistic care methods are often alongside traditional therapies. Some examples of additional holistic methods that we use here at Monty include massage therapy, music therapy, acupuncture, pet therapy and yoga. We certainly do have an extensive team here, Michelle. Um, can you provide some insight into the services that we provide and how Allied Health is integrated into our model of care? Yeah, thanks, Ariel. It's actually the um, in-depth Allied Health Service team that brought me over from, um, from a strong clinical background. So I think we're very lucky here at Monty. Um, we have um, over 120 permanently employed Allied Health staff. We provide essential care at a grade significantly above other aged care facilities. Monty has a full complement of allied health working on site five days a week, compared to the majority of other aged care facilities, which have a consulting allied health that deliver a limited service, sometimes weekly or fortnightly. The value of the allied health services on site is twofold. Firstly, that our consumers receive timely care as they're not waiting for the next scheduled agency visit, which may be weeks away. And secondly, as we have allocated staffing to our sites, consumers have consistency in receiving their care from the same therapist each time, which brings a level of comfort. Our staff going through specialised training and orientation regarding the needs of our community and specialised communication strategies. At Montefiore, we highly value that the care we provide is personalised and tailored to each individual's needs. On my previous slide, I demonstrated a few of the allied health that we have on site here at Monty. I also should note that we have physiotherapy, dietetics, speech pathology, and even dedicated psychology. We also have consulting audiology, optometry, and podiatry. However, in addition to those standard services, we also have dental services with our very own dental chair here in Ramwick, dementia and behavior support with qualified dementia consultants, a social work consultant who is currently focused to optimizing our palliation service, and a wonderfully dedicated leisure and lifestyle team that are responsible for all our great bus outings, our in-house guest entertainers, festival celebrations, birthday parties, movie nights, and even happy hours. And just to note for you at home, you can always refer to the Montefiore webpage if you would like further information on our allied health services. Interdisciplinary care and collaboration is beautifully demonstrated in this hands to heart image. We all work together utilising our different specialties with the consumer at the heart of all that we do. The examples of interdisciplinary collaborative care at Montefiore include electronic referrals in real time through our automated electronic record system. This means referrals are captured instantly and can be prioritised and actioned as needed. Every neighbourhood at Monte has regular interdisciplinary meetings called IDTs where unit managers, nursing staff and allied health meet to discuss all consumers on the neighbourhood and ensure that they are receiving the care they need. This is an opportunity to share ideas and make referrals to allied health teams in real time. We also run CCPCs or consumer care planning consultations for all consumers, initially at six weeks post admission, and then at least annually or as the consumer care requirements change. In a CCPC, the care team meet with the consumer and the consumer rep and discuss the current care plan. This is an opportunity for collaboration to consider the consumer's needs family desires and care team recommendations. Another example of our interdisciplinary care is our behaviour support plans. This is a collaborative document developed for consumers experiencing responsive behaviours based on an existing health condition or clinical need. This plan is developed after an in-depth review of the consumer allied health assessments. The outcome of this meeting is a set of personalised, non-pharmacological strategies aimed to minimise consumer distress 
optimise wellbeing and prevent further responsive, responsive behaviour episodes. In addition to our interdisciplinary care values of collaboration, evidence-based practice recommendations and holistic care, the other main value of Montefiore's care planning is the concept of consumer-directed care. This is a way of delivering care that gives individuals choice and flexibility in their own care. The principles of consumer-directed care are governed by the aged care laws to ensure older people's rights are protected. In the process of consumer-directed care, allied health complete their individualised assessment, provide education and recommendations. However, care goals and management plans are led by consumers and their representatives. The care plan is written to be flexible. So as situations change and consumer or family wishes change, so too does the care plan. Overall, consumer-directed care gives choice and control to the consumer for their own care planning. We work with you to create your care plan and have ongoing care discussions with you and your loved ones to ensure our services meet your needs. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Allied Health also really plays a pivotal role in supporting and promoting movement for the older members of our community. Um, how important is exercise for promoting active ageing? Exercise is extremely important. That's a great question, Ariella. I don't really know where to start, <laughs> but I've listed up here I could a, learn few, a, bit, Michelle. <laughs> a few of the benefits that I could, I could talk about this for the whole hour. Um, but firstly, exercise is essential for our physical well-being. There's notable research towards the benefits of exercise to reduce the risk of developing diabetes, heart disease, stroke, arthritis, and even many types of cancers. Furthermore, if you have these conditions, exercise is shown to improve treatment outcomes and in some conditions may also slow progression. Physically, exercise also improves your mobility, your weight status, your flexibility, and reduces the risk of falls. And all of these factors are essential in maintaining independence in your daily activities. In terms of your mental well-being, endorphins are released when you exercise. These are also called the happy hormones. They reduce your perception of pain and trigger a positive feeling in the body. Some studies have even shown that exercise can treat mild to moderate depression as effectively as antidepressant medication, but without the, all the side effects. There is also the social aspect of attending group exercise and the many positives that this brings. Exercise is also evidence to improve sleep quality and overall energy levels. As a dietitian by background, the benefits of exercise in aging for me are the strong association of exercise with the maintenance of bone mineral density and muscle mass as we age. Our bone mass peaks in our late 20s, and from the age of 40, we slowly lose bone mass with a noted decline for women during menopause. There is notable evidence to the benefits of resistance exercise in preventing bone mass losses, and even in increasing bone mass in postmenopausal women who have low bone mineral density. Resistance exercise is a form of exercise that increases muscle strength by working against a weight or a force. Some of the examples of resistance training are in this slide, such as squats, or push-ups against the wall or the floor or simple hand weights. Um, but I'll give you some more practical strategies in a minute. Another key benefit of resistance training is increasing muscle mass. Muscle is essential in maintaining mobility. However, also has been evidence to improve metabolism, blood glucose control and immunity. A study from the Journal of Nutrition looking at muscle mass changes as we age demonstrates that from the age of 50 onwards, muscle mass decreases by one to 2% per year. However, the news is not all bad. Muscle mass is modifiable and you can gain muscle mass or slow down muscle mass losses by resistance training within weeks. Physical activity is the highest risk factor for weight loss, even before starvation. I think this is a really important message to our loved ones who spend you know, majority of their day in a chair or have noted a significant reduction in their physical activity. As the saying goes, if you don't use it, you will lose it. A study published in the Journal of American Medicine looked at the effects of 10 days of bed rest on skeletal muscle in healthy adults. They took 12 healthy adults who were moderately active and asked them to remain in bed continuously for 10 days except for toileting. They all consumed an adequate balanced diet, so nutrition was not an issue. After the 10 days, they found no significant changes in fat mass. This is likely due to the fact that the body is very efficient at holding on to this concentrated energy source. However, despite no significant fat loss, the results found an average of two kilo loss of weight, a 10% decrease in leg muscle, and an overall reduction in muscle strength. 
This demonstrates how rapidly muscle loss wasting occurs with marked, with marked reduced activity. This could be the result of a week in bed with the flu or recent COVID um, or reduced activity with, with a sore joint. And further evidence is the importance of regular physical activity to maintain muscle mass. Um, and just to remind you that even if you've been through a period like this, you can regain the muscle lost with resistance exercise. So in terms of some practical tips to increase your activity, plan your exercise with a group or a buddy or attend a set class. The key here is accountability. You don't want to disappoint a friend and you don't want to attend a class that you've paid for. Do what you enjoy. If you enjoy it physically and socially, you're so much more likely to continue doing it. Don't forget incidental exercise. Get off the bus one stop earlier, park a little further away and walk a little bit further. Don't take the stairs and don't forget the value of movement in housework, gardening, vacuuming or even playing with the grandchildren. Exercise also doesn't need to be expensive. You don't need to join a gym or take expensive classes. You can exercise at home or in a shaded park area. Use resistance bands, small hand weights, even a couple of cans of beans at home. There are also multiple free exercise apps that you can use or YouTube videos that show you home exercises that don't need any additional equipment at all. Ideally, we should start with small realistic goals of exercising once to twice a week and slowly increase to your comfort to the recommended 30 minutes a day, five days a week, ideally with at least two of these sessions based on resistance training. Thanks, Ariella. Thanks, Michelle. There's some great tips there for people at home. Um, Alex, we'll move on to you now. Uh, what considerations do older people need to make with regards to their diet? Thank you, Ariella. Well, you know, there's lots of things that we could explore in this question because our diet needs change across the lifespan. And there certainly are nutrients that become more important, which I think we should explore together. Um, but firstly, to really answer that question, I'd like to share some information about the importance of nutrition as a whole. So if you just bear with me, I'll share my screen. Yes. So why is nutrition so important? You know, um, nutrition is important for all of us. It prevents muscle weakness and reduces the risk of falls. It reduces the risk of osteoporosis and fractures. It stabilizes blood sugar levels. It supports wound healing. It maintains healthy bowel habits and reduces the need for complex support and care. And there are certain aspects of aging that can impact on nutrition. As you can see from this detailed slide, many things that you may recognize yourself or you may recognize in a loved one. Um, for example, the reduced sense of smell or the reduced sense of taste, which can be very difficult um, for an aging population. Um, you know, we've got the reduced ability to feed yourself at times. Um, you know, we all hear the story of poor dentition or, you know, losing your teeth or often losing your dentures, which happens a lot at Monty. Um, everyone has a story about it. Um, and look, the consequences of that can include a lot of things in terms of physical well-being and physical health. So, you know, you're looking at consequences that can impact skin integrity. There's increased risk of infection, the progression of chronic diseases. And though I have just mentioned really the physical focus, the focus on physical health, it's also important to remember the impact that this can also have on mental health as well, as poor nutrition is linked with increased anxiety, depression, confusion and irritability. So for the elderly population, what key nutrients should we particularly be considering in active aging? you know, to help optimize nutrition um, and help prevent those, um, th that impact on physical health. So as we have mentioned, good nutrition does do a lot of things for our bodies. It um, improves general health and energy level. It improves immunity um, and, you know, it optim optimizes clinical health to help our residents to maintain their independence as well, you know, which is really important. 
And the literature tells us that more than 50% of older Australians in aged care are either at risk of malnutrition or, or are already malnourished. So it is really important to consider how you or your loved one can optimize their nutrition. So looking at ways to support that, I've listed some key nutrients here that we should particularly be considering in active aging. The first one is protein. Um, the recommended daily intake of protein is about one gram of protein for each kilogram you weigh. And when you're looking at high protein foods, um, these can be found in lean meats, poultry, fish and seafood, eggs, nuts and seeds, legumes and beans. Um, these foods also provide iodine, iron, zinc, vitamins, especially vitamin B12 and essential fatty acids. And I suppose, what does this do? You know, why is protein so important? Well, protein maintains muscle strength. It builds and repairs muscles. This supports the skeletal system. It improves balance and it helps renew the body's cells. Protein also helps to produce hormones, enzymes and antibodies to help fight infection. And it can also be a body source of emergency fuel, especially if in the absence of sufficient carbohydrate. So another nutrient that we would look at would be dairy. Um, you know, what are good sources of dairy? Um, we have all our milks, and I think all of us know we've got many different types of milks available these days. We've got our full fats, we've got reduced fats, plain flavored, powdered milks, evaporated milks, um, and soy beverage beverages that are fortified you know with calcium as well we've got yogurts um, we've got cheeses so all hard cheeses reduced or full fat um, any soy cheeses that are again fortified with calcium these are all good um, good ways to get dairy um, into the body and, you know, there are a lot of people out there and it's becoming more popular that people prefer to follow a dairy free diet because of allergies or intolerances um, or even by preference. Um, there's also the belief that sometimes milk can increase mucus. Um, however, there is no sufficient scientific evidence of any link between dairy products and mucus production. Allergies and intolerances should always be diagnosed by a doctor as well. Avoiding dairy foods and not making, making suitable alternative choices, such as the ones recommended in the food group, can affect your long-term health. So it is really something to consider, particularly when you are cutting out dairy in your diet. And then we have calcium. Um, so calcium is very important. It's, you know, We've spoke, spoken about how protein and dairy help maintain muscle strength and support the skeletal system. Calcium too um, promotes strong, healthy bones and reduces the risk of fractures. And um, there's many ways to get calcium into your diet. We have various different plants. So those green leafy vegetables, broccoli, chia seeds and black beans. You can have a look at fish, um, particularly fish with edible bones like salmon. Again, we've got dairy, which we just spoke about. So, you know, with dairy, you're getting that calcium factor, which is, you know, improving your healthy bones and reducing that risk of fractures. Um, and we also have a lot of calcium fortified products like soy milk or even in breads. So they're just some nutrients to consider. Another thing to, take, to think about with the aging in the aging population and with an aging digestive system, you know, as we get older, the digestive system can become more sluggish and gastric mobility and secretions can become impaired. So it's really important to include a lot of fiber in your diet to help improve nutrition and healthy bowel habits. So including fiber rich foods in your diet combined with regular activity like Michelle was speaking about and drinking plenty of water will help to keep your bowel habits regular, which is really important. You know, in terms of thinking what's what's enough fiber in your diet, the suggested fiber intake for adults is 30 grams a day, 30 grams a day. Um, foods that we can look at to if you're looking for tips on how can I get fiber into my diet, 
you can have fruit and vegetables, nuts, lentils, beans. That includes baked beans, lima beans, kidney beans, and peas. You can also look at getting whole grain breads and cereals as well, um, which is an easy way to include some fiber into your diet. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, there's some really good ideas for people of all ages there, I think. Um, as we age, we tend to lose muscle. Does that also include muscles required for swallowing? And as a speech pathologist, what should we be mindful of when considering swallowing as we age? Yes, um, absolutely. You know, it makes sense that there would be that relationship, you know, when we're losing muscle mass as we age in other areas. I think a lot of people recognize that, you know, we have that weakness that is associated with our limbs and we have those increased fall risks. But a lot of the time we don't think about how is that impacting our swallowing muscles. And for me as a speech pathologist, that's our primary area, particularly at Monte Fury. Um, we look after swallowing disorders and certainly aging has a big impact on that. So I just wanted to share with you a little bit of information on dysphagia. Um, you know, because this is a term that's heard a lot. And I think many people who might be online today has he have heard this term. Um, so really, what, what is it? So as we age, a decline in muscle mass can affect limbs, as I said, but we also have 25 pairs of muscles in our throat that are working together to have, you know, help us have that functional, safe swallow. Um, so swallowing difficulties fall under an umbrella term that we know as dysphagia. It can happen at any stage in the swallow. So these can be difficulties that you, your loved one could or yourself could find in your chewing. Even difficulty with the food traveling through your mouth. It could be difficulties actually swallowing. You could feel some pain when you're swallowing. Um, and we'll talk about some of the signs to look out for a little bit later on. Um, but these are all known as, these difficulties are all known as dysphagia. Um, you know, and the prevalence of dysphagia does increase with advanced aging, you know, in the sense that even 10 to 20% of individuals older than 65 years old are estimated to have swallowing difficulties, which is very young. And aging aside, we know that there is a range of what is considered normal um, for swallowing. So as speech pathologists, we will often refer to what is known as a functional swallow. And that's what we're looking for when we're looking at the aging population. Because it's quite normal to have these difficulties and to have changes in your eating and drinking as you age. Um, because there are a number of anatomical and physiological changes that impact eating and swallowing function. You know, for example, um, you might recognize in yourself or even in a loved one that uh, you're looking after that muscles are getting a little bit weaker. So it might be a little bit more difficult to swallow. People are finding it that they have a dry throat. They feel the timing of their swallow might be off. And although chewing function remains intact and we have the ability to chew and that doesn't change as we age, the reductions in muscle strength and loss of teeth impact food choices. So it does impact our chewing efficiency and our abilities to easily clear food from the mouth as well. So there are little things that impact and that general slowing of the aging, eating and swallowing system mimics that seen in the other systems, such as gait and mobility. We also need to consider that there are also sensory changes um, that are apparent. And that's what I was discussing in previous slides that can impact nutrition. You know, we do have that reduction in smell and reduction in taste, and that all impacts our swallow function. You know, our body, as soon as it sees food, as, see, as soon as it's seen a, it sees a drink, it's getting ready for that swallow. Our muscles are engaging and we're producing saliva, getting ready to be able to chew and swallow that food or drink really, really well. Um, and when we have a reduction in that sensory system, it of course impacts the overall swallow um, in an older person. 
Um, we also have a lot of medication use in aged care as well, and a lot of people on daily medications and many medications, and these can actually impact the sensation of taste and smell as well. Um, so these, you know, these age-related characteristics, um, we do expect to see um, some of these characteristics in older adults in general. And as a speech pathologist and as a speech pathologist too, since she's graduated, has always had some of her caseload in aged care and now full-time in aged care, we're becoming more aware of being able to distinguish between dysphagia, which is a real disorder, difficulty swallowing problem, and just age-related swallowing difficulties. Um, you know, and for us, it's important to acknowledge that so that we're not over-diagnosing or over-treating dysphagia as well, and that we treat it as something that is quite normal. Um, and we can look at ways that you can identify issues and also ways that you can increase swallow safety for you or your loved one as well, um, because we do expect that change to happen. So I thought it would be good to maybe have a look at what a swallowing difficulty looks like. Um, so, you know, just to give basic anatomy, and um, we can see um, you're going to see an arrow where the food uh, goes down the right way. So unfortunately, our breathing pipe and our food pipe are very, very close together, which is why so many people have difficulties. Um, and in a normal swallow, the food will just go straight into the food pipe. And in someone who has a real swallowing difficulty, it will go into the airway. And that is called an aspiration and it can have a lot of consequences. It can cause chest infections and pneumonias. Um, it can also lead to malnutrition as well. So I'll just show you because I think the video also speaks for itself. So you can see here. You'll see someone chewing and, and swallowing the food. So you can see it went straight down and have a look into this one. You'll see some pooling up around, if you think of where your voice box is, do you see some pooling there and it goes into the airway? You can see it just dripping down the front. So that's just really an effective image of what a swallowing difficulty looks like in a real dysphagia where someone swallows and that food goes down the wrong way. And you're thinking, you know, how do you know that's happening? How can we identify something like that? You know you may experience yourself that awful feeling where you have food go down the wrong way and you're coughing and it feels like you're not able to breathe. That's a major sign. So that coughing and choking feeling, that, that's an indication that food or food may have gone down the wrong way. You can often see someone frequently throat clearing as well. They can have a guardly voice after they swallow. Someone who has significant difficulty chewing as well so they're really struggling to chew food um, they're getting quite tired and fatigued that's a sign of a swallowing difficulty someone who may, may have pain when swallowing um, and you know for us as clinicians we're always looking out for someone who has recurrent chest infections so as you can imagine when you saw that fluid drip down into the airway if that fluid goes into the lungs it's very likely to cause an infection and, um, you know, overall, these following difficulties can lead to unexplained weight loss um, and malnutrition. And we just spoke about the importance of nutrition, particularly when you are aging. So it is something to really look out for in you and a loved one, because there are so many things we can do as speech pathologists to help. So I know it seems very scary when you're looking at it and um, you know, it's very distressing when someone does have a swallowing difficulty, but there is so much that we can do to help. And, you know, early identification is the best way to do it. So looking out for these signs can really help you or your loved one. So, you know, I wanted to really finish this question to look at. We say that there's a lot of things that can happen as we're aging, but there's always a lot of things that we can do to increase our safety when we're eating and drinking as well. So, you know, speech pathologists offer a range of treatment options to address dysphagia. And these include safe swallow strategies, which I have here. And they, you know, they encompass postural adjustments, um, 
And we also, you know, we can put together a rehabilitation exercise program. A lot of people think of rehab exercises coming from a physio, but we actually have a lot of exercises we can do as speech pathologists as well, um, which can help rehab your swallow and prevent any further deterioration of your swallow. Um, I think, you know, there might be many people out there who have experienced texture modification, so food or fluid changes. You might have heard of pureed diets, minced and moist diets, um, thickened fluids, uh, things that are very, you know, difficult to take, and it's a big change in someone's life. But we should always be pairing any food and fluid modification with safe solo strategies and looking at other options, which is a big part of our model of care in Monty that we're not always um, going to food and fluid modification. So just to mention some of these and um, to finish off, um, you know, eating and drinking only when awake and alert, ensuring upright positioning and actually remaining in that upright positioning for 20 or 30 minutes after meals, taking small mouthfuls, going at a slow rate, checking that your mouth is clear of food after a meal and there's nothing left over that could be causing, that could stay there as residue um, or cause an infection. You know, stop eating or drinking if you're feeling that short of breath or coughing and also ensure that you are doing regular mouth care. So mouth care is really important, a really clean mouth will reduce the risk of infection and anything in terms of chest infections, in terms of aspiration. So I know that was a big one, Ariella, um, but yeah, there's just a few tips. Thanks so much, Alex. Look, I know so many people work together to provide all of these services at Montefiore, and we work as a team to, to make sure everyone from uh, the kitchen and dining staff work with the dietitians, work with the speech pathologists, and it's it's an amazing environment for people to be in. Can you provide a recent resident experience which highlights that interdisciplinary approach to care? Yeah, and I think it will feed nicely into Maxine as well, because we've had the fortunate experience of being able to work together recently. And, you know, um, for me, and Michelle mentioned it, you know, being in the Allied Health team in Monte Fury, it's really a unique experience. And I'm saying it coming from someone who's worked in Ireland as well. I've worked in a variety of settings in Australia. We often are able to work with other team members and other disciplines, but actually having access to that team every day and such a, a broad team um, is quite amazing. And I would like to mention just one lady and I do have a video to show you that I think Maxine will speak to as well. Um, it's a lady, lady in her 70s who experienced a stroke when she was having an operation on her thigh bone. You know, following her stroke, she had dysphagia. She actually was unable to eat or drink at all and was fed by a tube. Um, she does have um, use of her left side, but her right side has a lot of paresis and she's not able to move a lot of it. Um, and unfortunately, she wasn't able to speak as well. Um, she could vocalize a little bit, but her communication consist wasn't very consistent um, and also some difficulties understanding language. So just to really, before I show you the video, some of the goals that we've been working on, um, is we started with a lot of swallowing rehab and um, then we went towards looking at increasing her communication and we found that the occupational therapist was doing work um, on passive movements on her right side and looking at her mobility and we started to pair up the communication therapy with the occupational therapy where this lady was able to kind of it was very important for her gauging even gauging pain um, and being able to communicate. So we trained up the occupational therapy team and how to use her communication device um, in therapy. And we've extended along. And um, the moment I want to share with you is a hala baking exercise that um, our beautiful Maxine that you're about to hear from led. And it encompassed both creative therapy. Um, we had our music therapist playing music in the background. She really uh, connects her Jewish culture and we had Hebrew songs playing. Um, and we had the occupational therapy assistant doing some movement and sensory exercises. And I was also working on her communication. So I just wanna share that moment with you. And I'm sure Maxine will jump in for me as well. Never mind. 
one and a fat one. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah, you have a funny feather if that's the case. You're going to try this one? You're going to pull again? Such a beautiful moment, Alex. I, I know that the, the resident and her family really treasured that moment. So thank you for sharing it with us and thank you for your insights earlier. Um, Maxine, you. on to you. Um, sorry for, for your wait. <laughs> um, can you please provide us with an overview of creative therapy and the benefits that residents gain from, from this practice? Thanks, Ariella. And hello to everybody out there. Thanks for linking in. Uh, creative arts can reshape the way we think about aging and also foster growth and meaning making later in our life. Uh, it's a humanistic uh, approach to care. That means really everyone has the right um, to be able to shape and inform and make their choices that are resonant and preferenced by them. And uh, of course, once they can start to elect and make uh, their choices, um, we can co-facilitate and support those programs. So creative therapy is a specialized uh, therapeutic service using the creative arts as a tool that is music, dance, art, drama, and we've also included yoga therapists across our sites now. And this helps to uh, facilitate resident-led or consumer-directed inter initiatives or interventions and that's those interventions primarily support connection, creativity, and well-being. And it is extraordinary how those things start to take shape. Once a resident starts engaging and, and finding what really provides them with that meaning, with that purpose, and with that sense of self, the project starts to become more and more inform, informed and it evolves in ways that residents can't quite imagine. So we've had things happen like a resident has exhibited uh, all of her poetry that she's written. Um, someone's exhibited their photography that they've taken. Uh, it's it, the, all the, that body of work is something that residents can choose to share or to keep as a personal um, keepsake. So there's a lot of ways creative pursuits can enhance someone's experience because they can really pinpoint and check what really matters. They can, they can follow that. And uh, it's very exciting to watch what happens as that purpose starts to become unlocked. Um, we've had a resident just recently uh, record um, playing violin for her daughter's birthday. Um, and that was something that the music therapist supported over a series of, of time. So how we spend our time and what we do with our time is very fundamental, makes us who we are. It tells a story deeper than just this period of our life, of our values and what matters and our connections. And so it's a, a really rich and wonderful and a deeply internal experience that is then promoted to be able to be expressed. Um, so there's lots of aspects about creativity that I can share. I mean, I think we've seen uh, in COVID how much the need for contact with each other, um, it's really heightened the fact that we need each other and, and that relationship is such an important basis of how we uh, function in our world. 
So um, that is primarily how we work. We work relationary, re relationally, and uh, we really explore making sure that the resident is um, primarily uh, driving those interventions. So they can choose their own art piece that they want to paint or play to mold or uh, uh, mosaic to create. They can, by doing that, they start to develop an enhanced self-concept and mastery, a much better uh, enriched agency in their lives. They can start to make choices and by doing that, their independence grows. And uh, something starts to lock in uh, to who they are and what they're about. And we've had residents uh, arriving to care with uh, having had a stroke when only with the ability to use one arm uh, who have never painted before and then moved into um, supported and moved into coming to the art room daily even on weekends and starting to paint just using that one arm and have built a huge body of work um, that we have been able to exhibit in the past of course COVID uh, limited that but uh, watching a person unlock their ability, their creativity, and their expression is truly extraordinary. And we should never uh, take for anything for granted or make any assumptions about anyone not being creative, because I think we all have the ability to be able to create. And uh, it's certainly evident when people can start to pursue that, uh, they can start to find a, a whole world and discover things about themselves that they've never known. Um, so I guess, how does that help? How does that benefit somebody? Well, in so many ways. Uh, we can have, we can see with a continuous sustained practice, for example, in dance movement therapy, that we have a greater range of movement starts to happen. Uh, there's definitely the sense of uh, endorphins being released because there's that great sense of uh, wellness that starts to happen and, and happiness and joy and the interactions that start to happen. And that just takes as a magic of its own. It just creates more and more interactions and that social opportunity starts to really give people a way to see outside of themselves and to broaden their awareness of what's around them, orientate them to place and time, be able to recall memories, uh, rich, important memories from their history, their cultural preferences. Uh, they can start to develop friendships as a result of that social um, cohesion and, and the opportunity to be able to interact with others and they can discover things uh, about others that create some curiosity and interest in their lives. So of course everybody is unique and that is uh, what's so special because all of our creative uh, um, engagement is really tailored by that. So when the resident has an interest it might be to uh, explore how to uh, use uh, paint or how to use watercolor or how to use oils or even more than that it might be to explore uh, sculpting and uh, that's anything is possible once the resident starts to lean into their creative interests so I've seen some wonderful wonderful projects that have evolved over time and uh, it's, it really, it blows people away. Um, it, it blows family members away when they see what someone has been able to create. It's testament uh, to who they are. And it offers us a, an extraordinary opportunity to recognize that whole person. So um, you can understand how much that benefits and, and how much uh, opportunity that uh, it provides for people. Um, there's so much more to share, uh, but I'll, I will hand over, I'll talk just to um, that video is to say that there was such resonance for, for this resident around her cultural appreciation of making color 
that when she received the challah, um, she really gasped uh, with such pleasure. So a creative pursuits is primarily around aesthetics and enjoyment and pleasure, and uh, it's deeply beneficial. Sorry, Ariely, just muted. Sorry, everyone. Uh, tell me, has has technology impacted the role of creative therapies? And and during COVID, you know, how did that increase the use of technology and, and our appreciation for it? Oh, absolutely. We're seeing so much more uh, use of technology in many of our interventions. We have a TOFA TAFL, which is projected um, um, projector from the ceiling that we're able to uh, explore their varied games that the residents can you uh, engage with on a tabletop. We've had the use of virtual reality where people have gone dolphin diving, they've gone to countries of interest and revisited their um, childhood uh, and places where they've grown up. We've had uh, a projected images of um, the, their photographs on their walls in their bedrooms to be able to offer them additional opportunities to see things differently uh, instead of just in a small book or uh, on a file. Uh, we've got playlists, lots of playlists of music um, so people can tailor a specific playlist to their preference and we see residents sitting with headphones, listening to their music, and they, they can choose, obviously, whatever works for them. Um, and we've uh, got video simulation therapy that we've used before, which is a recorded messages from the family that offers us um, an opportunity to do labs, and then the um, staff can use that video to reassure um, a consumer or resident at any time that they might need. Um, there is also a wonderful uh, use of drawing on iPads that we are exploring. So we're definitely seeing that our cohorts of residents are really enjoying leaning into technology. Uh, some residents are taking their own mobile phones into the art room and selecting their own images. Um, so there is a lot of scope for us to continue to explore that. Um, Fabulous the um, interactions. I, I think there's also some great ideas there for people at home that they can very easily incorporate in their lives. But do you have any other suggestions oh, for those people at home in, in all types of creative yeah. therapy? Absolutely. It's a super um, idea to be able to make your own playlist. Creating a Spotify playlist with all your preferences, a great way to start the day. Uh, make sure you set yourself up in a beautiful space, something that gives you pleasure. Uh, uh, allow the light into your room, uh, create an opportunity to uh, sit outdoors. Uh, all of these uh, exposures to different elements will help our creative journey. So you can do things like cook even is a wonderful creative activity. Uh, you can um, make sure that you can uh, um, explore, you can doodle while the music is playing. Doodling is a wonderful way to be able to discover things that you didn't think that you could do. Um, you can also, uh, you know, I think be open to, to just exploring things and, and allowing yourself permission to be able to be creative. I think that's the most important thing um, to, to make sure that you, you set the scene and set the, the tone for yourself. Thanks so much, Maxine. Um, we we are running out of time. Now, I don't have time for all of the questions, and, and please note that if we don't get to all of the questions, uh, we will contact those people who have asked directly with answers to their questions. I do have one interesting one that's just come through for me, actually. Uh, the question is, um, how can I best access allied health services such as occupational therapy or a dietitian or any of these services if I want them at home? Um, we have a Montefiore Help at Home service, which can provide all of these services in your home. 
either through an aged care package or for a fee-for-service. Um, we assess those, res those clients who are interested in those services and, and often suggest other services that they haven't even considered that they might need or benefit from. Um, so when we do send an email um, afterwards uh, with a recording of this session and also some information, we will have those details for people who are interested in tapping into those things uh, in their own homes. Um, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, thank you to our panellists, Michelle, Alex and Maxine for your expertise and dedication to our residents. As we mentioned, um, you are part of a tremendously talented allied health team here at Montefiore and we really feel that you make the most extraordinary difference to our residents and their families, so thank you. Uh, we'll be sending a recording, as I said, of this seminar, uh, which you can um, review or share with, with those who may be interested. Um, and please get in touch if you have any other questions or queries about any of our services. If you're not yet a member of Montefiore, we'd be grateful for your support as we near the end of the financial year. Our membership drive is in process at the moment, uh, so please access our website for details on that. Uh, we feel financial circumstances should never be a hindrance to someone receiving our care and um, your help is, is greatly received. Thanks again for watching and we hope to see you again at our next Spotlight event in the coming months. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.